Get ready. Sometime between now and the heat death of the universe, Gran Turismo 7 is set to launch and I'm betting it's going to be closer to the latter. Details on the game are held tighter than a Russian state secret, but looking at the announcement trailer and listening to interviews with the development team, here are a few things we can already work out. The most obvious fact is that the game is a PS5 exclusive. This means shiny new ray traced graphics, possibly dynamic weather, faster loading, and knowing the developer Polyphony Digital's history, probably a 120Hz mode and possibly even a VR mode. At least, this is what I would have said, until this. Now we don't know if GT7 will actually get a PS4 release, that quote doesn't actually confirm it despite what you might be told, but if GT7 does get a PS4 release then how does that change what I said above? Well the PS4's P uh, CPU is incredibly slow, something like an estimated 8 times slower than the PS5 CPU depending on how you might measure it. CPU speed is incredibly important to racing games, it's where the physics calculations and AI calculations are run. If Polyphony Digital need to support the PS4, then they cannot do anything on the PS5 CPU that the PS4 cannot handle at 60 frames per second. This limits the PS5's potential to less than half, even at 120 frames per second. And note, I'm not saying GPU. Graphical effects are fine, PD can lower the resolution and effects to hit whatever target they need, but you cannot have a different driving model on PS4 than you have on PS5. We're just going to have to wait and see how this plays out. PS4 vs PS5 aside, Gran Turismo 7 is a numbered installment in the series and there will be a solid single player campaign to appease those left cold by GT Sport's multiplayer focus. That is what we do know, or at least it's what is safe to guess at, but that leaves a lot we don't know. What should a fully fledged Gran Turismo game even be now? Let's find out. I grew up on racing games. There was nothing better as a kid than heading to the local arcade and wasting some middle-aged manager on Final Lap 3. Then at home there were the likes of Test Drive and the amazing original Need for Speed. One thing these games all had in common was that they all featured either racing cars or supercars. That was just common sense, right? I mean, after all, why would anyone want to drive a car in a game? They could drive every day for real. When Gran Turismo hit and I first saw those family cars lurching around on their suspension, there was just no going back. I could finally answer the question, is my mum's car faster than a taxi? It was awesome being able to take cars I see every day and pit them against each other, pushing them to their limits. There was truly nothing like it. But that was then. Now it's decades later and the simple joy of driving streetcars in a video game just isn't going to cut it anymore. Gran Turismo's single player campaign has always been so simple you could program a bot to do it. Win championship, upgrade car, win championship, upgrade car, repeat until the credits roll. That was basically it and Polyphony Digital knew it was broken. That's why they took that part away with GT Sport. They were heading down this path long before the PS4 era though. GT5 introduced seasonal events and the well received missions. This continued into GT6. But this is where Polyphony Digital stopped expanding the single player campaign to focus on multiplayer. Which is great, multiplayer really is what all racing games should be about. There is nothing better than actual racing against real people. But it's not everything. There is a desire from the player base for a strong single player campaign. But when those same players are calling the traditional campaign stale, what should the Gran Turismo 7 single player campaign look like? One answer has been staring Polyphony Digital in the face for over a decade now. The museum. No, I'm, I'm actually serious. This is a potentially epic single player mode. All that's required is a little imagination. In GT Sport, the museum cards are those random facts that have popped up on your screen by the time you've got back from the toilet, but there can be so much more. Taken as a whole, they chart quite a lot of motorsport history and indeed the car itself. But instead of just reading them, why can't we play them? This could be a game mode that starts out early. We could read a few cards about early motorsport history before Renault introduces one make racing to the world with their R8 Gordini. Here instead of skipping to the next card we could enter a small one make R8 Gordini championship to win that car. Ah, a few cards later the 2000 GT at Fuji. Finish first or second just like the card says and win that 2000 GT. Skip ahead to 1989 and throw the Sauber around Le Mans for a first or second finish to win that car. Make it all the way to 1995 and we can test the damage model of the, um... Wait, this is Gran Turismo, isn't it? Um, 
1996 and the Diablo 1 make series 2015 and it's the GTR versus the world at Bathurst. These are not just random examples either. All the cars and tracks I just mentioned are already in GT Sport. The car models are there, the tracks are there, the museum is there, the rest is up to Polyphony Digital. But that is just one game mode and let's give PD some credit. Missions were a great start to revamping the single player experience. The TT rally was fun. The circuit experience is a great idea, challenging a driver to really learn a track while building skills that will need online and later in the game. And who doesn't want a Sunday Cup and used cars? Let's see them return, but let's give them some bite. Make the AI more competitive. Don't let players just increase the power of their car to smash the field and give us tighter fuel and tire restrictions. Online races in GT Sport are far more interesting than offline and not all of this is simply due to having human opponents. Online is the future though, and while people might complain, the truth is that in comparison to other racing games, we have never had it so good. It's not perfect though, and I'm not talking about the penalties. The daily races in GT Sport are daily only in the way that a cyclist clips into clipless pedals, but that's a low hanging fruit. Making the dailies actually daily is an easy win for GT7 to achieve. The bigger problem is that these races suffer from OP car syndrome. Any experienced GT Sport player can remember a time when any Group 3 race was just another McGann charity cup. To combat this, PD have implemented the BOP system, which attempts to balance the performance of each car to make them equal over a lap. If a car is a little fast, then update the game with a patch that reduces its BOP power. If a little slow, then do the opposite. But no matter how clever a system is, it will never be perfect. There will always be one or two cars that are quicker than the rest around a specific track. So what's the answer then? One make racing? Sure, that's the easy answer and occasionally I would love some one make races. But PD have already invented a mode that was perfect for mixing up the action online. It's called Shuffle Racing. Shuffle was an online mode where players were assigned a random car from the same class to race in. These were standard cars and the performance difference between them was sometimes huge, but so was a smile on your face when racing. You might have dominated that last race in the WRX, but how are you going to go next race in the SUV? If we could get this mode back into GT7 along with the option to have shuffle races with BOP turned on, then this would be an amazingly fun addition to sport mode. And sport mode needs fun. FIA races are great and all when you want that serious strategic action, but what about those times when you just want to kick back with a beer and do in the virtual world what you would get arrested for in the real? That's where modes like Cat and Mouse come in. Cat and Mouse goes way back to the OG Xbox when online racing first hit the mainstream in games like Project Gotham Racing 2. Endless serious racing is great for a while, but ultimately it leads to the same drivers winning over and over. Cat and Mouse at first seems like organized chaos, but requires its own unique, separate set of skills. The idea is that a lobby is split into two teams. One driver on each team is the mouse driving the slowest car in the game. The rest of the drivers are cats driving whatever they feel like. When the race starts, the team that gets their mouse over the line first by whatever means necessary wins. It's mad fun no matter if you are the mouse or one of the cats and it would be great to see this or other crazy online modes make it into GT7. That's all the creative low hanging fruit. But what about the logical? There is no racing format anywhere in the world that allows a driver to qualify for a race in a totally different car than they start the race with. But in the FIA sanctioned GT Sport, this is just normal. And what's more, you can qualify just once for every single race that week. Qualifying is meant to be a driver pressure test. You have a short amount of time to absolutely nail it or else you're gonna start last. But with GT Sports Unlimited qualifying, there's just no pressure at all. If you mess it up, just have another go before the next race. It doesn't matter. Your best time from whenever you felt like doing it is all that matters. But what if you only had one short session before the race starts to set your best time? That would be much more exciting, we'd mix up the grid and you could still have your best time uploaded to a leaderboard. It's just win all around. It's the small details that make and break games and while GT games have always done a lot right, they also get a lot wrong. Take ghosts for example. When I click on a time on a leaderboard, I expect to be able to race that ghost right there. It makes no sense to make me back out, go to a different section, download a ghost, then go back to where I was, load it, and if I can remember what file it was, finally race it. PD needs to make this easier. There is no reason at all for the mess it is now. And for that matter, why not give players the option to race against the next fastest ghost? 
So on your first lap you race against the ghost in last place, cross the line and the ghost just above you on the leaderboard is loaded for you. This would be awesome as players don't have to go hunting around for anything and it provides a challenge just within reach. The very same logic applies to the livery selection. Why not let players browse liveries for cars and apply them on the same screen? Why don't they show up on this screen? Currently you need to dive into the discovery section, select liveries, fill in all the fields correctly as if this was some kind of tax file simulator, then just hope you put in all the details correctly so you don't have to do it all again. And then after all that you can only save the livery here. You need to actually go to your home garage to actually put them on the car. At the most basic level at least pre-fill these fields with the currently selected car. Ideally this screen should disappear altogether, there's just no reason for it to exist. Assists. Here is another area that deserves some attention in Gran Turismo 7. Every single time you enter a race with a car that isn't in your garage, you have to dive into the menu and set up the assists just the way you like them again. It has become second nature now. Enter a race and immediately dive for the TCS switch. There needs to be global assists that are the default for all cars no matter if they're in your garage or not. And while we're here, it needs to include a real option. An option that allows you to select only the assists that the real life car actually has. This is important because if I take out an old car, it's because I want to experience driving an old car. I don't want ABS and I don't want TCS on by default. I want to lock the brakes and slide around corners because that's the fun of an old car on the track. And while we're on this marvelous rant, let's have a chat about the 2015 Dodge Charger SRT Hellcat. It was sold with either an 8-speed auto or an 8-speed auto. Yet we can freely select manual in GT Sport. What about the EK Civic Type R? That was only sold with manual but we can select automatic anyway. There are countless examples of this throughout all GT games and you would hope that with the amazing attention paid to the exteriors of the cars a little care would be taken to model the internals correctly also. And this isn't just nitpicking either, it can have real gameplay implications. This here is the GT86, an awesome low powered sports car that comes in manual and auto models that are completely different beasts. What makes them so different is the transmission. Each has a different gear ratio and this changes not only the performance but fuel consumption also. Both of these can be the deciding factor in a race as we have already found out on this channel. Links to those videos in the description below. It would be amazing if in GT7 selecting manual or auto would give us the correct real life spec gearbox for that car. Of course with every new GT release everyone expects more. More cars, more graphics, more sound, more of the physics, more of all of the things. More tracks and cars is a gimme. Of course they will build on top of GT Sport, adding more cars and tracks on top. And PD never failed to deliver on amazing graphics, even if they do drop a horrible looking trailer every now and then. It's the specific features however that are a worry. GT5 had amazing rain effects and it was just common sense that all GT games from that point on would feature at least rain. Then GT Sport was released on a console with far more power and yet, where was the rain? It was a long time before weather was patched into GT Sport and when it came it was underwhelming and almost never used in online races. We did see a glimpse of dynamic weather in the initial GT7 trailer and this means that PD is working on dynamic weather. Let's just hope it makes it into the final cut of GT7 along with the day night cycle. What we haven't talked about so far are physics and sound. Sound is the great unknown here. GT Sport made massive improvements in this area. Is this going to continue in GT7? Who knows? But physics. PD has always both delivered and disappointed with its physics. They have delivered by incrementally updating their suspension and tire models over the years. Disappointed by delivering a simplified clutch and transmission model that has changed little since Gran Turismo 1. If I have just one wish for the GT7 physics model is that it would include a realistic transmission model with a good clutch and things like torque steer on powerful front wheel drive cars. You might notice that we haven't really covered damage. This is because I'm not a masochist. I'm not going to wish for something that we are never going to get out of a GT game. Just ask Kazunori himself. The most that can be hoped for on this front is a little more cosmetic damage and maybe some handling effects, but riding off a car is off the table for Gran Turismo. It would be great to see at least tyre damage though. The ability to genuinely damage the tyres by locking up the brakes in ACC adds immensely to the racing experience. We can only dream of that kind of detail being added to Gran Turismo 7. All in all, Gran Turismo 7 has tremendous potential. Potential to both amaze and disappoint. I'm going to err on the side of optimism. 
GT Sport revolutionized online racing, and the thought of this being expanded upon alongside a revitalized campaign mode is an exciting one. For now, we just have to wait and see.